Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good morning, and welcome to the first session uh, of the Science Workshop. Um, this is the genomics session. My name is Simon Mercer. I work for Microsoft, and I'm responsible for the area of health and well-being uh, within the external research team, the team that's running this conference. Um, we're going to have four speakers today, and um, we have a two-hour session, so everybody gets, uh, all speakers get 25 minutes uh, with five minutes for questions. Uh, if you run long, we'll leave the questions until the end, just in the, in the interest of keeping things moving. Um, I think we've got two decks loaded on here and two laptops to change, so we should be able to keep to time. Uh, our first speaker today is Professor Robin Gutel from the University of Texas at Austin, and he'll be talking about prediction of RNA secondary and tertiary structure while determining fundamental principles of RNA. Thanks, Simon. Okay. So, um, when Darren, Darren Green spoke first this morning, he um, prompted me to change the order of my slides so that um, I can say something about my past. And this, this is what I consider to be my abbreviated CV, which is that uh, it shows the few places that I've been and it shows what I study, which is ribosomal RNA. Um, and Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Okay. So, first, I'm going to talk or try to talk, and Simon will alert me for maybe 10 or 12 minutes, and then David Gardner will come. David Gardner is my graduate student and he will, he will give the second part of the talk. And um, I'm not sure how many of you are biologists, so I'm not sure how much of this is gonna be a repeat for brand new, so I have the, difficult, the difficulty of trying to give a talk that addresses two different audiences. But um, we study, oops, getting the, the buttons mixed up. We study RNA. And I've been studying it uh, starting as a graduate student in the late 70s. And at the time, it was considered sort of this third molecule. Proteins and DNA were the main molecules, and RNA was just some intermediate. And um, fortunately, my PhD advisor had already determined that RNA is very significant, way ahead of its time, so I had the good fortune of starting to study something 20 years before people started appreciating it. This I like to show, this is in the June 2007 front, front page of The Economist, and it's talking about RNA, saying, acknowledging that there are many, many experiments now showing that RNA is extremely important in the regulation and function of cells. And um, so what I do, our interest is in studying the structure and uh, the structure and evolution of RNA. And in the past, it sometimes would be viewed as a esoteric academic problem. And while it's still an academic problem, it has huge, its, its value in understanding biology has increased tremendously. And so, th so the major topics that I'm going to cover are, I'm, I'm going to talk about a major paradigm sh change uh, in cell biology, uh, two of the grand challenges in biology, the identification and characterization of RNA structure, uh, actually, and predicting RNA structure using two different methods. And uh, one of them is comparative analysis. And so I'm going to talk about points one, two, three, and then David Gardner will talk about three and four, the development of a novel 
comparative analysis database system, which is SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server, and applications towards uh, the RNA structure prediction. Okay, so this is just a quick cartoon of the cell, and sort of the main take-home lesson is that the cell is very, very complex. It's got many, many different components in it, and, and our interest is in those components that involve RNA and, um, and traditionally in science and physics in many areas of science it is a reductionist approach which is that you try to isolate the molecule or the, or the factor of interest and you isolate it and study it and you assume that by isolating it in its, it, you, you will understand it in how it works in, in its more complex pro, um, system. The problem is that, that many times doesn't, doesn't work, or I should say it, it helps at the beginning give you some appreciation for the molecule, but then it breaks down. It breaks down because it's a very complex system with many, many interactions. Okay, so RNA science. Um, it's, this is actually a repeat of what, what was on previous slide. Grand challenge. One of the grand challenges in biology is to take an RNA sequence. In this, clay, this case, it's tRNA, fold it into what's called its secondary structure, and ultimately fold it into its 3D structure. And its secondary structure is composed of these watson crick based pairs, G, C, A, U, that are arranged into a helix. And so our, this is our major objective. Some might say that this is simple. What's the problem? I thought so when I started graduate school. Here I'll try to explain why, why it's not. Um, this is a sequence versus itself for tRNA, and each little line here is a potential helix that's composed of GC, AU, and GU base pairs. And if you look here, there's 37 potential helical elements, but in the final structure, there's just four. And so our goal is to identify those four out of 37. The number of possible structures, which is the comp which is the combinatorics of arranging all of these into different structures is 2.5 times 10 to the 19th. You get into larger molecules, which is what I studied for as a graduate student and, and have continued to, to study 16S and 23S, 1,500 nucleotides long, 3,000 nucleotides long. Uh, the number of potential helices is significantly larger, the number of possible structures is, is, ast is astronomically larger. So we have a much, much more difficult task in trying to predict the correct secondary structure for these larger RNAs. If I knew the problem was this difficult when I started, I, I actually would not have, have done this as a project. I'm glad I was naive at, at the onset. Okay, so we also know that RNA any macromolecule tries to find its most stable structure. And so from experimental methods, from a reductionist approach, it was actually determined that, that, that these base pairs are stable. And what's shown here is, is people have actually determined how stable each, each type of base pair is. But any time you had a loop, a loop considering an unpaired region, that was considered destabilizing. And so you, you essentially tally up all the stability, which is minus 24.9, and subtract the, the, the amount of destabilization, and this is your amount of stability for this entire helix. And I'm gonna skip the second part. And, and so the question is, how well do algorithms work that use those simple energetic rules? And here's some secondary structures, and all those that are predicted correctly have this thick line in it. And so for this molecule, it actually did pre pretty well, it's about 70%. But 
But for some molecules, 16S over here, you see that it does, ver it does very poorly. And to quantify that here, approximately for different molecules like 16S and 23S, the accuracy is, is in the range of like, say, 40, 50 percent. And for smaller, mo smaller molecules, it's a bit higher, but it's still not at 100 percent. And um, I'm going to skip the second part there. A second major problem challenge in biology is to determine the phylogenetic relationships for, or, for organisms that span the entire tree of life. And this was work that my PhD mentor, Carl Wolves, did by studying ribosomal RNA. And so he was the first to come up with a, a tree that encompass all forms of life, and in the process, he found the third kingdom called, called the Archaea. And here's a famous quote that says, nothing in biology makes sense ex except in the light of evolution. And I've sort of turned this around. It says, nothing makes sense in evolution without a strong understanding of the biological system that you are actually studying. OK. so. Our underlying premise is that Mother Nature has already done the experiments. And what, we are, what I've been doing for the last 25, 30 years is to collect all these sequences, 16S, 23S, et cetera, and to analyze them and use a method called comparative analysis. And the underlying assumption is that all 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 tRNAs, for example, will fold into the same structure. Even though they might only have, say, 40% sequence identity, they fold into the same secondary structure and the same 3D structure. And so, hmm? okay. So, um, I did this for 20 years. People solved the crystal structure the high resolution crystal structure for 16S and 23S they're shown here and the question is how well did comparative analysis predict the um, secondary structures and the answer is for 16S 23S about 97 98% by looking for a common structure You might say, and some people did, Robin, that's very good. It's time to retire. Well, one, I'm, I'm not at retirement age. Two, I don't have enough money to keep me going for a long time. And three is that there's far more interesting problems to solve. So this is the secondary structure, and this is what we predicted accurately. But this is the actual 3D structure. And what you see is that there's many, many more interactions that we did not predict. And that's what we want to do, and that's what David Gardner will talk about. So this is just to quickly show you, again, the same helix. But in the crystal structure, what you see is these loops are actually paired up. And that, and that many of these unpaired regions here are actually paired over here. And so we have a, a website called the Comparative RNA website, and we disseminate all of our data onto that website. So um, from past to future, this is an amazing quote that Carl Wolves said in 1983. The comparative approach indicates far more than the mere existence of a secondary structure element. It ultimately provides the detailed rules for construction the functional form of each helix, such relationships of a helix and perhaps even reflection of its detailed energetics as well. One might envision a future time when comparative sequencing provides energetic measurements too subtle for physical measurements to determine. This is what David's actually going to talk about. This statement was in 1983. Uh, to me, it's absolutely amazing. Okay, very, very quickly, because I'm running in the minus time right now, we have and so to achieve this, we have, to, we, we, we have to collect, first of all, lots and lots of sequences. And so this is, um, this is to approximately say that we have over a million RNA sequences to study, and there's actually, there's actually even much more than that. And so all of that needs to be organized. 
We have crystal structures, high resolution crystal structures. We want to organize those into a database and cross index those with all the sequences. We have a phylogenetic tree, so every single sequence maps onto a node on this tree. We want to cross index that information with the sequences and with the 3D structures. And this is just to show you sort of all the different types of information that we want to put into a centralized system, organized and cross-indexed, so that then we can do sophisticated queries of that data. Uh, tool development uh, with, 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 with Microsoft's, um, or Microsoft awarded my, my lab a TCI grant and our objective is to essentially do what I just said that needs to be done. Uh, very quickly, uh, we fortunately met Stuart Ozer, who's working in Jim Gray's lab, and he was intrigued by this problem, and he essentially said, I want to work on it. And that was, again, to integrate all these various dimensions of information, properly index it, so that we can begin to query it, look for relationships, Okay, so I'm actually almost done, which is good. Um, this is how it currently is. We have lots of flat files for all different types of information and to essentially uh, find relationships becomes very, very difficult, time consuming and essentially impossible. And with Stuart, we developed this SQL Server system which we call RCAD. And I'm going to stop now and let David continue. And that's the laser. So the idea behind this, uh, this whole process is to actually move everything that we do into the database. This will let us do things that we have been doing previously much faster, and much more importantly, it lets us do uh, certain types of analysis that we couldn't do before. Um, I'm going to skip that. So the so some of the stuff is you know covariation analysis, more structural analysis. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is RNA folding. So again, just to repeat the the idea behind. RNA folding, what we're trying to do is take the primary sequence and predict the secondary structure. After that, that could be used as a starting point for the uh, molecular modeling program to predict the tertiary structure. So how are, do current methods uh, try to predict the secondary structure? So the most, the most popular method is a free energy minimization. And so each structural motif that you could possibly have in a secondary structure is given an energetic value. And programs basically just go looking for the structure that gives it the lowest value, the, the lowest overall value. Um, the, probably the most popular program used is Enfold. And so what we did with Enfold is we gave it a bunch of sequences and said, what's the most state, what, what do you think is the most stable structure? And we, plot, and the, we took that energy value of this of the most stable potential structure. We then actually f forced Enfold to fold into the correct comparative structure, and we plotted that energy, val that energy value too. And so that's down here. And so if the values were, if, the, if it predicted everything 100% correct, all the values would be on this line. And you can see there's a pretty sizable gap. And what that means, and, and so what this means is that this structure here, for this sequence here, Enfold thinks that there's another structure that's not the correct structure, that's much, much more stable. And in fact, to get from here down to here, there are, Enfold thinks that there are dozens, maybe even hundreds of structures in between there and the actual correct structure that's more stable than the, the structure that you would actually see in a cell. And so now this, is, this gap exists, and so this, this is done on 16S ribosomal RNA, which is a fairly large RNA molecule. But we went and redid this analysis for a smaller molecule, tRNA, which is only 76 nucleotides long. And as you can see, it crowds the line much more closely. 
And in fact, this corresponds to the fact that it gets um, uh, higher, ac you know, higher accuracy on the tRNAs for smaller molecules. But this also kind of indicated to us that for large RNA molecules, such as 16S, a purely energetic approach just is not going to work. But if you look, if you're working on a smaller distance, this has a better chance of working. And so, first, let's talk about how well does MFOL do. And so, 16S, 23S are big, large RNA molecules, and it does fairly poorly. For the smaller 5S molecule, which is only 120 nucleotides, it does much better. But still, it's not close to 100%. So what we came up with is a new way of doing it. As opposed to just focusing solely on energetics, we want to focus on taking account distance. Uh, the, the idea being that nucleotides are in close proximity, are much more likely to interact. Um, this means that you only look for helices that have short, that have small, simple, or conditional distance. But we are, we're not going to ignore energetics. Energetics must play a big part of this. Um, but one of the problems with the energetic parameters used by most of these folding programs is that many of them are experimentally determined, but many of them cannot be. I mean, there's just too many parameters. And so we want to f generate our own uh, pseudo-energies, uh, statistical potentials. And we, if we do uh, comparative analysis, we should be able to generate some better energetic parameters. And finally, we want to focus on the kinetics of the folding process. And so the, the secondary structure actually fo forms while the RNA is still being transcribed. And in fact, it, it folds very, very fast. And so there, is a, there needs to be an idea behind a, a, a a folding pathway, a direction to the folding. And this kind of ties back into um, looking for helices that only have short or simple, you know, simple or conditional distance. So the uh, first analysis we did on, f to look at the distance constraint was we went and took a bunch of sequences again and we looked for all the potential helices and so the energies of the potential helices are along. And so the most stable are down here. The least stable are down here. And we look for all helices, irregardless of what the distance of formation was. <coughs> and then we, so, and so this red line is the count of actual helices that are in the comparative structure. And you see most of them are down here at the least stable. But you still have quite a few down here. More importantly, this red, this orange line is the accuracy, how, how um, the rate that this uh, potential structure would actually for, be seen in the comparator structure. And so for, when you don't look at it, when you ignore distance and you just look at all helices, even for the really stable helices, you have a very, very low um, rate. But if you shrink it down to, and you only, and so the table, it just the, it just shows that these are the actual numbers. And so, for the most stable, there's eight percent, eight percent for the next layer level. And so, if you shrink it down to simple distance, and you only look at helices that have a simple distance of 150 or less, the most stable get there's a much higher rate of formation. If you look at for 40. Again, you get a much higher rate. At 10, for some of these, you get almost nearly 100%. And so this idea is that you look for helices in a small window. And if you do that, you should get a high accuracy rate for the most stable helices, possible helices. But you still have a number of comparative helices that are fairly unstable. So one of the things we we're looking for is to um, try to even, you know, so increase the prediction rate for those that are on the least stable. And so the, one of the ways we can do that is by improving our 
energetic parameters. And so one of the problems behind the approaches, current approaches right now is that they treat all unpaired regions as destabilizing. And we don't believe, I mean, as you can see in the crystal structure, a lot of these pair up are actually interacting and they are actually stabilizing to the uh, RNA. And so one of the things we want to try to do is to generate statistical potentials that more accurately um, reflect this uh, uh, concept. And so first thing we try to do is just to do this type of analysis just to recreate the stacking energies for base pairs. Um, and so what we do is we take the frequencies and we pass it through an equation and we get the a statistical potentials that we've normalized to kind of um, be in the same range as the experimental energy, energies. And basically this just shows that there is a fairly good correlation that this idea that frequency is equivalent to stability is, holds up um, for something that's already been, you know, for experimental energies that's already been determined for like for stacking, stacking base pair stacking. But we can extend this by looking for, you know, for basically hairpins, uh, which are the, these down here. So, and so if we use um, comparative analysis, we can um, try and, and do a statistical analysis and try to get st um, st hairpins of this type sometimes are not considered stabilizing. But we believe that there are certain hairpins that are very stabilizing. And if we can accurately uh, represent that, uh, I believe that the accuracy of the prediction will go up. And so, hey, so the idea is helices with short, simple distance have a higher rate of prediction. But once you've done this, you can do this as an iterative approach. So if you predict the first nucleation point, um, so if you properly predict the nucleation point, then it becomes a basically, it simplifies the problem. And it, it becomes a more of an iterative approach. And so, so after you've nucleated the first set of helices, does this distance hypothesis uh, still hold? And so the idea is that we have is that if, you've, if these he helices have already formed, it shrinks the distance for this, the, this pair here to, for, you know, to interact. And so before these helices um, <coughs> form, the simple distance is 79. After, um, the conditional distance is 15, but in fact, if you look at the actual the uh, crystal structure, the conditional distance is actually about five, um, because these are all paired up, and so this, these two are very, very close, and they're very likely to you know, bump into each other, interact. And so basically, we redid the same analysis we had done before, but now we do it for conditional distance. So this is after every hairpin is nucleated, we're done. Um, and so it, this just shows that the, the orange, and, it, and again, as the conditional distance gets smaller, the prediction rate goes up. And the future work um, is to improve our CAD so that we can uh, cross-index multiple dimensions of information and find a kin a more relationship between structure and sequence and have it improve our structure prediction, also help us improve our alignments, um, and try to finish the folding algorithm. And the question is now or? Okay, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, uh, since we're recording this, if you could uh, speak into the microphone in the middle there, uh, we'd appreciate it. Or not. Okay, well, I have a question. Um, when you, uh, my assumption is that the, the gold standard for checking your predictions against is crystallography, is that right? Well, yes and no. I mean, we've... The, the crystallography was to use to show that the comparative analysis, the comparative structure was correct. And so we're using the comparative structure as our gold standard. I see. So, but ultimately, your, um, the crystallography data is... 
Well, I mean, it, it basically. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, could, yeah, exactly. Well, well, the idea is that we use the comparative structure. I mean, there's only certain. There's only there's a limited number of crystal structures, and so we can't. We don't. We we don't want to be testing against the same three or four or five sequences, and so we basically show that the comparative analysis structure is correct from this crystal structure. And since we have several hundred thousand sequences that have been properly aligned with several hundred thousand crystal It just strikes me that if, if there's a weak link in this, it's, uh, I, I don't know how many crystal, uh, crystallographic structures you have, but, uh, uh, yeah, but about a handful. Um, so, okay, two handfuls, but. Uh, but, I mean, that would be one of the, that would be one of the, I mean, we would test those 10 sequences, and we would also test another thousand that we don't have crystal structures for. Right. And so, I mean, if, the basic idea is that if we're predicting those 10 correctly, we're predicting the other ones correctly, too. Okay. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much.